we look at every subject that we want to film and then we say, well, what is the best way to get into their world? It's an amazing moment when you realise that you're actually seeing some stuff for the first time. My name's John Downer and these are my incredible team of spy creatures. Well, I suppose it all started when I started making wildlife films and I wanted to have that kind of intimate perspective to get into the animal world and actually know what it's like to be an animal. So over the years, use used technology to get more and more inside the animal world. And as things have progressed, we've moved from just using remote cameras disguised as rocks to where we are today, which is having you know, these incredible spy creatures which are able to do filming, cameras in their eyes, but they look like the animals and the animals we interact with them. The whole idea of you know, using the robots uh, came about when we made a film about penguins. For the first time we thought, well, what if we made a penguin cam? A living, moving camera that looked like a penguin that was able to go into the colony and start picking up these incredible shots. You can't explain it because it's, it's a dream come true. I think part of the, the whole technique is, is to try and get inside the animal's minds. You know, understanding animal behaviour is key to it all, really. We lost one spy pup to a wolf. Spy tortoise was washed by an elephant. And I think it's something about the fact that they look living makes them think before they actually do anything. And if it's not a threat, then they kind of, they quite like it. The challenges are, they're innumerable because everything is a challenge from the beginning to the point you get the film. The animals, once you get there and once you're actually with them, they tend to be the least of all the problems. They usually do deliver because they do amazing things. And if you've got the technology to be able to film close to them and in their world, you know, you are, you know you're going to get something remarkable. The most important thing to know, if you only know one thing, is that disaster robots make the disaster go away faster. My name is Robin Murphy. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering at Texas A&M, and I work with disaster robots. 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing happened. One of my grad students went up and helped, and he came back and said, We've got to do it differently. We could have had robots like are being designed to go to Mars, to get into places where people and dogs can't go. Well, we're talking about our robots, either ground, aerial, or marine robots that can help responders do things that they can't do any other way. And so in 1995, we all started working toward disaster robots. It was 2001 before we actually used one. And that was the first use of ground robots for a disaster. It's the ability to do things you couldn't do any other way. They needed to get more than 18 feet into the rubble. Robots can go into these places to get to where there might have been survivors. If I can see what I need to see, I can make good decisions to keep the responders safe. So this is the part where we make fun of me for driving. So notice that right now I'm driving heads up, but really the trick of a robot is to get out, get beyond visual line of sight, because that's really the point. Disaster City is one of the emergency management complexes that Texas A&M has. It's designed to test and to train search and rescue teams on how to conduct search and rescue missions. We've supplied robots for 28 disasters. Earthquakes, Hurricane Harvey, we assisted with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. 
When we go, we bring robots and people that we've tested and practiced with in our training exercises. One of the biggest challenges to doing work in rescue robotics is not the robotics, it's the everything else. You're going to a different world. It's really challenging to be at a disaster. There's a, a physiological and psychological impact of that. It really takes quite a toll. So you have to be really good at what you're doing. But my job is so incredibly fulfilling. It's about the science and the technology and the way it could be used for societal good. That's a big deal to me.